Good morning, Apollo. Welcome to Seattle. So happy to have all of you here in our wonderful city and state. I'm very excited to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Washington State Labor Council President April Sims. <laughs> April is a union sister in our broader labor movement, a mother and a brilliant leader. As the president of the Washington State Labor Council, she has been breaking glass ceilings and forging a new path. She's a true trailblazer. trailblazer. As a leader in the Washington State Labor Movement, she has been a vocal supporter of Apollo. She firmly believes in the power of working people organizing together, and she's dedicated her life to affirming that power. I'm proud to serve alongside April on the Washington State Labor Council Board, where we're working together to transform our movement and to lead on centering racial justice as a critical part of winning on all of our justice fights. She is the first woman of color and the first black person to be elected as a Washington State Labor Council Executive Officer and not only that, but she is the first elected black leader of a state federation. I'm so excited to have April here today to welcome you all to Washington State. Let's give her a warm welcome. We can let that play a little bit, huh? <laughs> Appreciate y'all in the back. Shout out to my IATSE members in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Lagaya, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Sisters, brothers, siblings, like Lagaya mentioned, my name is April Sims. My pronouns are she and her and I have the privilege of serving as president of the Washington State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. We're the largest labor organization in our state, representing more than a million or half a million workers across 600 locals, workers in every industry, sector, and corner of this beautiful state. And like Lagaya mentioned, I have the distinction of being the first woman in Washington and the first black woman in the country elected to lead out a state AFL-CIO. But more importantly, more importantly, I'm proud to serve with Sharika Carter, who is our secretary treasurer. Our historic and uncontested election makes Washington the only state in the nation to have a labor movement led by two black women. And while I think that might say a little something about Sharika and me and our leadership, I think it says even more about the Washington State Labor Movement and our deep commitment to racial, gender, and economic justice. And since I'm bragging on my state a little bit, welcome to Washington, by the way, let me lift that we proudly boast having the third highest union density in the nation. Yeah. And I know New York and Hawaii are in the room, so I just want to put y'all on notice that we're coming for the number two and the number one spot. But that means at nearly twice the national average, one in five workers is represented by a union in Washington state. And it doesn't stop there. I'm also proud to be a card carrying member of the Seattle Apollo chapter, which is the largest Apollo chapter in the country. You see my siblings over here holding it down. And that speaks to the hard work and the organizing of our chapter president, Eunice Howe, and, and the amazing staff team of Amy Leong and Paul Ryan Villanueva. 
thank you for showing them some love. So a big shout out to all of the Seattle chapter members with special recognition to first vice president and WSLC vice president representing Apollo on our board, Lagaya Domingo. <clears throat> our national board members, Eunice Howe, Tracy Lai, and Jason Chan. I see y'all. And I wanna thank President Stephen Moy and the entire Apollo leadership for inviting me to address your convention this morning. I do not take the invitation to be, it, to be here with you all lightly. Like many of you, organized labor is my home. And rooms like these fuel my soul. And many more working people are finding their home in our movement. A movement based on collective action, unwavering solidarity, and radical acts of love. Through our work together and over this convention, we can ensure that working people seeking justice can always find a home in organized labor. And we know that after the deep isolation of the last few years, folks are craving connection and community. The connection and the community that the labor movement provides. We need an outlet, a way to channel our fear and our pain and our frustration and move that into action. In this moment, channeling the fear of uncertainty and the pain of isolation into connection, camaraderie, and collective action is truly a radical act of love. And that's why we're here today, because that's what we do in the labor movement. We find our connection to each other, to our shared struggle, and to our shared vision for a better future. And even in these deeply polarized times when businesses and politicians sow division to try to convince working people that there is more that separates us than unites us, we know what unites us as working people. That we labor for our money, that we work for a living. The billionaires and the bad bosses who promote a scarcity mindset that encourages this idea of competition, that either I win or you do, but we never win together that somehow my fellow worker is my competitor, not my comrade, but we know that workers are rising together. Our dominant culture will push this myth of individual success over collective progress. That in order, yeah, you can boo for that. <laughs> that in order to succeed, we must push ourselves forward without holding out our hand to pull others along with us. But in this room, we believe in our collective liberation. Those in power want us to fight for scraps, to blame this group or that group for our problems, to decide that our neighbor is somehow taking what is ours. But organized labor and our communities have always and will always reject this individualist, isolated view of human progress. And we do that by leaning into the power of our connection and our community, of our collective love for one another because we believe in the power of collective action and the responsibility that we have as a family to take care of one another, to love one another. In a culture that pushes us to disregard the needs of others so that we might benefit, seeking out love, growing our connection, and building our community is a conscious choice. And it's a choice we make in the labor movement every single day. How else do we explain the vibrant solidarity that unites us if not a manifestation of our love for each other? How else do we explain our fundamental and deeply held belief that an injury to one is an injury to all? That we are indeed each other's keeper. That's what love is. Love is when you hurt, I hurt. And when you win, I win. We're loyal to each other, even when we disagree because that's what family does. And like a family, sometimes we get into it. But in this family, we work through our issues together, recognizing that sometimes conflict is how we grow. But we never lose sight of our responsibility to each other and to the power of our collective solidarity. This is the labor movement that working people want. This is the labor movement we need, and this is the labor movement we are building together. A labor movement rooted in our commitment to care for each other. A movement where workers are rising together and leveraging our deep ties and trusted strategies to fight for our collective liberation. Organized labor is one of the few places where working people can come together across race and place, ideology and ability, gender and sexuality. Our movement has the opportunity, rather the responsibility, to meet this need for all workers because we do it together 
and we do it with love. This opportunity is only made possible because of all of you, because our constituency groups are at the heart of our communities and remind us of our love for each other and remind us of our collective call to fight for our liberation. Workers can't rise together without all of you. We need you to push our institutions to do better, to be better, to live out our vision, to build true working class solidarity across gender and race and place. And so when I was thinking about what I might leave you with today, I was thinking about watching Wonder Woman with my family. I've shared this story with a couple of folks in the room and uh, I was watching Wonder Woman with my family. It was COVID uh, and I'm team Marvel, but you know, not so much DC, but what are you gonna do, right? It's COVID. And I'm watching Wonder Woman and I'm watching her fly through the sky and I remember thinking if I could fly, how would I do it, right? Would I fly with my hands up in the air like Superman, out to the side like an airplane, behind me like a dart? And I spent most of the movie thinking through the advantages and the disadvantages of these three specific ways to fly. And when the movie was over, I asked my family, if you could fly, how would you do it? So I asked my daughter, Naya, and she's admittedly A-type, right? She's graduating. She's going to be a nurse in a couple of months. Shout out to WSNA. So Naya is very, you know, she's on year nine of her 10-year plan. I said, Naya, if you could fly, how would you do it? up in the air, out to the side, behind you like a dart. And Naya said, mm-mm, no. I would fly with one hand up, one hand bent, my knee bent, so that I could move through the air with maximum efficiency. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I didn't even think about that, that you could fly with one hand up and one hand bent. So I asked my daughter, Jasmine, Jasmine, if you could fly, how would you do it? Up in the air, out to the side, behind you like a dart. Jasmine is my collective child, right? She's a spoken word artist. She's never, her hair is never the same style or color for longer than a week. She's an organizer with Teamsters 117, so shout out to Teamsters. And Jasmine said, no, I wouldn't fly like that, Mom. I'd fly like I was snowboarding. I want to rock heel to toe through the sky and land sh on my feet real cool. And I thought, I didn't even think about that, that you could fly like you were snowboarding. So then I asked my husband, Marcus, if you could fly, how would you do it? Up in the air, out to the side, behind you like a dart. And Marcus is a total dad. Right, all he wants to do is chill and watch sports. So he says, no, I wouldn't fly like that. I would fly laying on my back with my hands behind my head and my feet crossed at the ankles. And I, I thought, I didn't even think about it. Somebody's like, yeah, that sounds amazing. You and Marcus would get along great. I thought, I didn't even think about that, that you could fly on your back, chilling through the sky. So I became fascinated with this question and I started asking folks everywhere I went, if you could fly, how would you do it? Up in the air, out to the side, behind you like a dart. And the answers were amazing. One person told me they would fly like a butterfly, low to the ground from flower to flower to flower. And I thought, that sounds lovely. Naya would hate it. Not super efficient. <laughs> Someone else told me they would fly with a bumper pad in case they bumped into anything. Someone else told me I'd fly with wings. Someone else told me I want to fly in a flock with all of my union siblings with me. Someone else told me I'd levitate. I want to be 12 inches off the ground so people can just watch me glide by. And that sounds like fun. And then I asked my daughter's boyfriend, Elijah, if you could fly, how would you do it? And Elijah said, oh, Miss April, I wouldn't fly. I would teleport. And I was like, I didn't even think about teleportation. But that's the beautiful thing. When you invite people to imagine with you, to create with you, no one ever says, April, that's impossible. We can't fly. I'm not even willing to entertain that idea. Everyone is willing to pause for a moment and imagine and create. And so I've learned that if we invite the people around us to imagine with us, to innovate with us, to bring their different ideas and their perspectives, their different needs, we not only come up with several ways to fly, we realize that there are infinite ways to move. So sisters, brothers, siblings, I'm grateful to be in this movement with you. I'm grateful for our shared vision for our collective liberation and I'm looking forward to flying with you. Thank you.